You know, when you send in that paper, what emergence can possibly mean? I have to admit, the title alone had me hooked. It gets right to the heart of something that feels kind of magical. How do complex systems, like, well, us, even exist? It's a question that's captivated philosophers and scientists for centuries, and this paper dives right into the deep end, exploring how emergence plays out at different levels of reality. Okay, let's unpack this. What makes this paper? By Carol and Parola stand out from other deep dives into emergence. What fascinated me is their emphasis on dynamics. They argue that to truly understand emergence, we need to move beyond just looking at the static properties of a system and focus on how those properties change and evolve over time. So it's not just about taking a snapshot of system, but watching the whole movie, seeing how those individual frames come together to create something completely new. Precisely. Think about it this way. Imagine trying to understand a traffic jam by just looking at a single photo of cars stopped on a highway. You'd miss the whole story, right? The buildup, the bottlenecks, the chain reactions, all of those dynamic processes that actually create the traffic jam. Makes sense. So how does this dynamics first approach change the way we think about emergence? It allows for a more rigorous classification of different types of emergence. Instead of just saying, oh, that's emergent, we can start asking more precise questions about how those emergent properties arise from the underlying dynamics of the system. I'm intrigued. So instead of a one-size-fits-all definition of emergence, we're talking about a spectrum of possibilities, each with its own quirks and implications. Exactly. And that's where their classification system comes in, starting with what they call type zero or featureless emergence. Type two emergence, huh? That sounds deceptively simple. What's the deal with that? It might sound basic, but type zero is actually foundational to their whole framework. Imagine a many to one mapping where a whole bunch of different microstates, the microscopic details of a system all get bundled together into a single macro state. OK, I think I'm with you. So instead of needing to know the exact position and momentum of every single molecule in a glass of water. Mm. We can just talk about the water's temperature as a macrostate. Perfect example. And what makes this type zero emergence is how neatly those microstates and macrostates line up over time. Yeah. You can either let the microstates evolve and then map them to the macro level, or you can map to the macro level first and then evolve those macrostates. And you get the same result either way. So there's this underlying consistency between the levels. The macro level isn't somehow detached from the micro level. It's more like a simplified view that still captures the essential information. Exactly. And this seemingly simple idea has some pretty profound implications. It helps explain, for example, how the bizarre probabilistic world of quantum mechanics, when you zoom out to larger scales, gives rise to the more familiar deterministic world of classical physics. Hold on. Are you saying our everyday reality is basically a type zero emergent phenomenon? In a way, yes. It's like looking at a mosaic up close versus from a distance. Up close. It's just a jumble of individual tiles. But step back, and a clear image emerges. You've lost some detail, but gained a whole new level of understanding. A recognizable picture. That's a pretty mind-blowing way to think about it. But if type zero is this elegant mapping between micro and macro, where does the whole surprise element of emergence come in? That's where things get even more interesting, right? When we move beyond that neat, predictable mapping to systems where the whole seems to be greater than the sum of its parts. You're talking about type one emergence, what the paper calls local emergence. And this is where we start to see those surprising, unpredictable behaviors you mentioned. Okay, so type one is where the magic really starts to happen. Mm -hmm. Give me an example. What kind of system exhibits this local emergence? Think about a colony of ants. Each individual ant operates with relatively simple rules. Find food, return to the nest, repeat, but put thousands of ants together. And what do you get? This incredibly complex self-organizing colony that can build elaborate structures, navigate intricate mazes, and even defend itself against attackers. Right. You'd never guess just from watching a single ant that they were capable of that kind of collective intelligence. And that's the hallmark of type 1 emergence. The behavior of the whole system can't be simply deduced from the behavior of the individual parts. It's as if this new layer of complexity emerges from the interactions themselves. It's going, in a way. It's still consistent with what we were saying about type zero, right? Yeah. We're still talking about micro-level behavior giving rise to macro-level properties. But now the connection between those levels is less obvious, more, uh, well, emergent. Exactly. And what makes type one even more fascinating is that it pops up in all sorts of unexpected places. Think about the stock market, for example. Millions of individual traders, each making their own decisions based on their own information and motivations. Yet, 
From that chaotic sea of individual actions, these large-scale patterns emerge. Booms, busts, trends that no one could have predicted just by analyzing the behavior of a single trader. So, it's like the old saying, the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. Yeah. There's this inherent unpredictability baked into these type 1 systems. Mm -hmm. Even if we understand the basic rules governing the individual parts. Precisely. And that raises a really interesting question. If these emergent properties are so unpredictable, does that mean they're fundamentally unexplainable? Are we just stuck saying, well, that's emergence for you? I mean, that's kind of what I was getting at with the whole magic thing earlier. Is there a point where science just hits a wall when it comes to emergence? That's the million dollar question. And it gets right to the heart of the distinction the authors make between what they call weak and strong emergence. Now, both type 0 and type 1, despite their mind-boggling complexity, are still considered weak forms of emergence. Okay, I'm sensing a but coming here. You know it. And that but leads us to the even stranger territory of type 2 emergence. So type 0, we've got our nice, neat mapping. Type 1, things get a little fuzzier, but still rooted in those micro-level rules. Right. What makes type 2 so different? Where does the strong come in? This is where things get truly mind-bending. Type 2 emergence, or what they call non-local emergence, throws out the rulebook we've been operating under. With Type 2, we're no longer talking about emergent properties arising from simple local interactions between clearly defined parts of a system. It's less about scaling up and more about, well, a fundamental shift in what we even consider as fundamental. Okay. You're going to have to hold on a second and walk me through this slowly. Uh, what kind of system are we even talking about with Type 2? What's an example of this non-local emergence? The classic example, and the one that always seems to spark the most debate, is consciousness. Think about your own subjective experience, the feeling of what it's like to be you. It doesn't seem to be reducible to any specific set of neurons firing in your brain, right? Okay. Yeah, I can't say I've ever found the consciousness neuron in those brain anatomy diagrams, but I'm still not getting how this goes beyond the weak emergence we've been talking about. Isn't it possible that we just need a more nuanced understanding of the brain, better technology to study it? And then we could, in theory, pinpoint the source of consciousness. That's precisely the point. With type 1, we could imagine, given enough computing power, simulating the entire system and predicting its behavior. But type 2 challenges that very notion. It suggests that some emergent properties might be fundamentally irreducible. That even with perfect knowledge of every single neuron and synapse, we still couldn't predict the emergence of something like subjective experience. It's not just about complexity. It's about something else. Something... Uh dare I say, almost mystical. Are we venturing into the realm of the truly unexplainable? Mystical might be pushing it, but the paper does argue that type 2 emergence, if it exists, could represent a genuine limit to reductionist explanations. It suggests that the whole truly is greater than the sum of its parts, not just in a practical sense, but in a deeply fundamental way. Wow. Okay. That's a pretty profound thought. So where do we go from here? If some things are just fundamentally irreducible, does that mean science hits a dead end? Not at all, but it might mean rethinking our approach. Instead of trying to break down complex systems into their smallest components, maybe we need to focus on understanding the principles of organization, the dynamics that give rise to these emergent properties in the first place. So instead of getting lost in the weeds, we need to zoom out and look for the patterns. The underlying principles that connect seemingly disparate phenomena is like we've been so focused on mapping the trees we've forgotten about the forest. Exactly, and who knows? This shift in perspective might not only help us make sense of things like consciousness, but also lead to breakthroughs in fields like artificial intelligence, economics, and even physics itself. So you're saying that even if there are limits to reductionism, there are still endless frontiers of knowledge waiting to be explored. This whole deep dive has been an incredible journey, from the elegantly predictable to the downright baffling. I have to say I'm walking away with more questions than answers, but in the best way possible. It's like Carol and Parola have given us not just a new lens for viewing the world, but a whole new set of questions to ask. And sometimes asking the right questions is the most important step of all. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Well, on that note, I think it's time to wrap up this mind-expanding deep dive into the world of emergence. If you like us are now both exhilarated and slightly terrified by the potential of type 2 emergence, head over to the show notes where we'll link to the paper and some other resources to help you dive even deeper. Until next time, thanks for joining us.